Good day to you, brothers, sisters, friends, and new faces, and welcome to Current Events and Christian Expectations. And today in this podcast, we're going to discuss the discerning of spirits. Witchcraft is your craft. We'll lead off with Leviticus 20, verse 27, and we'll have many other scriptures that we reference and read today, and we'll put those in the overview. But with the season of witches upon us, let's discuss witchcraft should be our craft, and let's just dig right in. How serious does God take witchcraft? Well, in the Old Testament, they were to be stoned until they were dead. Here, Leviticus 20, 27. A man or woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Uh, They shall be stoned with stones. A person who's a medium, or today sometimes they're called channelers, necromancers, someone who traffics with the dead, they shall be put to death. Uh, Of course, uh, some will say, well, that's the Old Testament. Or if it's not the Old Testament, that's Salem, Massachusetts, where those crazy Puritans Mm. got all paranoid about witchcraft back in the 1600s. Well, okay. But certainly in the New Testament, they are not to be executed. But they are there. Acts 16, 16 through 18. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out of her that very hour. Interesting that it's proclaiming a good thing. It's it sounds like it's proclaiming a good thing, yeah. so we need to investigate as to why Paul was so perturbed. Uh, first of all, take note, spirit of divination, which is exactly what the mediums and the necromancers of the Old Testament were called upon to do, to divine certain truths that can only, supposedly, be discerned from dipping in to the dark side, talking to the dead. Because, of course, the dead know everything. Well, this young girl was making a lot of money for her owners, and she had a spirit which enabled her to do that. Note, Paul didn't call for her death by stoning or any other way, and not even imprisonment. But he really got tired of her using God's name for two reasons. Most High God, which is a legitimate reference to God found in the Old Testament, might, in an idolatrous society be open to interpretation. Maybe this is just another God among all the other gods. And And considering the source it was coming from. And considering the source it was coming from, uh, Paul was not happy with it. And he put up with it long enough. He became greatly annoyed. Greatly annoyed. annoyed. (laughs) I mean, it would probably be bad enough just to be around Paul when he's annoyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But greatly annoyed. Wow. And then to call out the Spirit, and that was the end of that. Now, her evangelization, which... I say evangelization because in the Bible, in the gospel accounts, when the demon is expelled, people come to the Lord. So I'm just assuming that. But note, her evangelization was a result of her impinging on Paul's normal evangelization. He apparently did not have a mission to convert the witches of Ephesus. (laughs) She gets exorcised and converted as a result of becoming a problem for Paul, not because Paul had put her on the list of people to be evangelized. Interesting. And yes. But hey, we're not against that because witches, even today, do get converted. Perhaps you have read recently in the past month of the conversion of Kat Von D. Yeah. Well-known witch and former star of LA Inc., which I've never seen, but it was on TLC cable programming. It's pretty popular. Yeah, apparently, from what my research has told me. Yeah. Uh, she was recently baptized Uh, by an evangelical church, Baptist church, located in Vive, Indiana. Back in the 70s, I held a revival in Vive, Indiana. Close to Cincy, just west of Cincy. Close to Cincy, but we we didn't see any witches. You can access uh, access the video of her being baptized online. Uh, Here's uh, some of her testimony from the Christian Broadcasting Network. Quote, uh, Last July, says CBN, she revealed her ongoing transformation to... Uh, her social media followers. Uh, Quote, I don't know if any of you have been going through changes in your lives right now, 
but in the last few years, I've come to some pretty meaningful realizations, many of them revolving around the fact that I got a lot of things wrong in my past. Today, I went through my entire library and threw out books that just don't align with who I am and who I want to be, she explained. In her Instagram post, says CBN, uh, there were books on witchcraft, magic, and tarot card readings. End of quote from CBN. Well, is witchcraft for real? Yes. Now listen to a similar testimony. Again, Book of Acts, some 2,000 years ago. The background is Paul's in Ephesus, and the wonderful things are happening. People are getting converted. The miracles are not just miracles. Luke says they're extraordinary miracles. Yeah. Uh, Paul has sweatbands, and he just takes a sweatband and gives it to somebody. They run across town with a sweatband, lay it on some guy who's demon-possessed, and the demon just leaves. So this is, as we would say, some crazy things are happening. Yeah. But listen to this in view of the conversion of the young lady I just told you about who got, right, <clears throat> who got rid of her uh, paraphernalia from her witchcraft days. Uh, Acts 19, 19 through 20. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. You know, we uh, recently, uh, several months ago, uh, other shepherds from our local congregation, we went and saw a couple in their home. And uh, they had been into similar things, but also into drug use and other other items. And, you know, it just experienced a real world uh, happening where this person uh, gave us all their drug paraphernalia, their, their ornate smoking pipes and expensive regalia that went along with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, for us to take. And, and of course, we, we took it. We said, no, now what do we do with it, right? But uh, we took it to local law enforcement. There was a connection there, and they took care of it. But it was beautiful to see a, a real-world scenario where it right. took place. Right, right. Kat Von D as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and all sounding very biblical, Yeah, just as in the Book of Acts. Yeah. 50,000 pieces of silver, uh, back in those days, uh, uh, one piece of silver would be the equivalent of a day's wages. So 50,000 pieces, how long would you have to work 50, to save up days. that kind of money? Oh yeah. uh, so there is uh, money to be made in the uh, use of witchery paraphernalia. These days, witches see Halloween as a celebration of Sahayan. Uh That's an old pagan holiday goes way back in time to October 31st. And it's centered on the passing of the dead and getting in contact with the, the past dead for the particular help you need. Here's an example from a website, Refinery29, is its title, is the name of this website. This is from an article, October 30th of uh, 2020, written by Elizabeth Gilino. And uh, here's how that goes. There's no one way to honor Sahin. Traditions vary with witches, as that is part of the allure of being a witch, explains Mistlecraft Ariana. Now, her given name is probably Ariana, but I'm sure Mistle, Mistlecraft, there's that, there's that craft again, witchcraft, uh, is part of her new name. Uh, she has her own website, keen.com, K-E-E-N. Um, and she says, anything goes as long as it has the correct intent. Of course, some witches speak with these spirits. And a Ouija board is a standard tool to speak with those who have crossed over, notes Mystical Craft Ariana. Meditation, or excuse me, mediation and connecting to those in our hearts is another way to connect. Or you can cast a circle and ask for your deity's help, she says, explaining that each witch has a deity that they feel close to. So there are a lot of deities out there, as God, or as uh, Paul says, many, uh, many so-called gods, yeah. uh, as he writes to Corinth. Um, they all have a deity so that they can reach out for help and guidance in life. Uh, the internet, based on my research, abounds with examples just like this. The dark side is for real, with spiritual danger lurking in that darkness. Uh, listen to this from First Chronicles 10, 12 through 14. All the valiant men arose and took away the body of Saul, the bodies of his sons, and brought them to Jebesh. 
and they buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord and that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. He sought guidance from a medium, not from the Lord, so he was killed by the Lord. However, having an unsolicited supernatural experience is something that needs to be evaluated. We need to look at that for just a couple moments. So listen to this. This is from the Christian Post uh, of uh, October 6th of this year. Over half of Americans claim to have communicated with deceased relatives, either in dreams or other means, and the moderately religious are the most likely people to say they've had such a supernatural encounter. A recent survey by the Pew Research Center found that 53% of Americans say they've had interactions with loved ones who have passed away. Of course, these 46 experienced the interaction with in a dream, while 31% claimed it took place in some other manner. Additionally, 34% of respondents said they felt the presence of a deceased family member, 28% have spoken about their lives to them, and 15% felt that a deceased relative reached out to them. Just under half, that would be 44% of the participants mentioned, having at least one such encounter within the past year. That's a quote from um, Christian Post. Well, okay. Psychologists say there may be as, as many as nine different kinds of these experiences where a person is contacted uh, by someone who's deceased. In other words, the relative or friend in question is not looking to contact the dead. It is said the dead has reached out to them, okay? All right. Um, and there's at least nine different reasons that this happens, say psychologists, uh, looking people looking for comfort uh, to matters of reconciliation. Uh, if you're involved, uh, as I have been at times in Christian counseling with such matters, you've got to vet these things. But first of all, um, the dead coming back. You know, there is in the New Testament a, a great scene where that happens. Moses and Elijah yeah. come back, as it were, from the dead and uh, on the mountain, the Mount uh, of Glory, Mount of Transfiguration, and it discombobulates the disciples who are there completely yeah. when that happens. Um, Poor Peter. And, yeah, once again, well, he spoke for everybody because somebody has to say something, yeah. even if it makes no sense. Yeah, he was so ready, fire, aim. Yeah, it's ready, fire, aim, and there it goes. Yeah. Um, years ago, in a book entitled The Ring of Truth, written by J.B. Phillips, uh, who has still a very popular paraphrase of the New Testament that you can find, he was a well-known scholarly Anglican preacher back uh, in the 40s and 50s uh, of England. Uh, he tells an experience where after C.S. Lewis had died, who he never met personally, which is sort of odd being they're both well-known uh, evangelical Christians back in the day, yeah. um, showed up twice in his living room uh, after C.S. Lewis had passed away and spoke uh, seven words each time he came to him. And the seven words were, it's not as hard as you think. And he says, I don't know what to finally make of this experience. Um, I put it out there because it happened. I'm the least kind of person expected to yeah. see a ghost and hear it talk to me. Um, but he said, that's just something I think we we need to take into account when we're talking about the ring of truth and things that are are real. Yeah. So I think quite a few people maybe have had, you know, uh, I've had dreams of deceased people that I've interacted with. They've either said something to me, very limited like that, mm -hmm. or just been there, present, smiling or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think having dreams of people who have passed on is is typical. Yeah. For, for most people. Uh, the question is, does a person in the dream uh, make an effort to actually contact you in a way that normally does not happen yeah. in a dream experience? Um, so uh, people uh, over a period of time who had uh, some confidence in me uh, would share with me these unusual, odd experiences they had with people who were near and dear to them in their life who came to them in a vision uh, and both times, well, one was in a vision, one was in an audible. In other words, he just heard the voice. Uh, the other was visionary. Uh, and um, I have taken 
their testimony to heart and listened to it and couldn't discern anything demonic, any theological error. There was nothing involved encouraging immorality or blasphemy. It was all about comfort. It was all about making the living comfortable with the ones who had experienced death. Uh, and I've never had that kind of experience, but these are legitimate, serious people who just, because they had it and they were so rattled by it, they had to talk to somebody, and uh, they came to me. So let's keep this in mind, however. Even Jesus was given a vision by Satan. Luke 4, 5 through 7, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him in a moment of time all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, all of this is given to me and you can have it. Just one thing, get down on your knees, you know, and, and worship me. And of course, Jesus refused. Um, this is why, even if you're dealing with counseling with people who are serious, you got to listen to what they say to make sure that they have not been deceived because Satan is in the deception business. This is why we have 1 John 4, one. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Yes. For example, let's test, let's vet the following. This comes from the Daily Caller, uh, October 6th of this year. It's a little, it's a longer quote than usual, but please listen and pay attention if you would. Quote, President Joe Biden's administration hosted indigenous knowledge seminars, including one where a speaker admonished scientists who were in attendance about disrespecting the knowledge provided by spirits, according to a video uncovered by the Washington Free Beacon. Now, T-E-K-O-S, that's Traditional Ecological Knowledge Outreach Specialist, <laughs> That's a, that's a true title. <laughs> Maloney Montano said in the April webinar attended by the scientists, quote, you're disrespecting the teachers that they obtain the knowledge from. You're disrespecting those spirits that may have brought that knowledge to them through a dream. We continue the quote from the Daily Caller. On the state level, Hawaii's, now this is current, Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources Deputy Director M. Calio Manuel advocated for indigenous knowledge. And what I'm, let me stop what I'm saying there. That's the people who would be native to the country, uh, who would like indigenous Indians in our country, um, who have gained knowledge by extraordinary supernatural means. That's what we're talking about here, okay? So this Deputy Director M. Calio Manuel advocated for indigenous knowledge and delayed a request for water diversion to fight the Maui wildfires due to possible impacts on a local farmer, according to a letter sent by Hawaiian Water Management Campaign. He also prioritized incorporating indigenous knowledge to the fields of water advocacy and management in Hawaii, which allegedly could have contributed to the worsening of the Hawaiian wildfires. Wow. Of course, trafficking in spirits at the federal level as serious as if we didn't have other problems at that <laughs> right. level already. And concerning knowledge brought through a dream, hear this, because although in the Old Testament you stone these kind of people, and we don't do that in the New Testament, these scriptures remain valid for assessing supernatural events as to their falsity or the truth. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder... And the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So even if such dreams help indigenous knowledge, <laughs> watch out. Such dreams and dreamers can lead to idolatry at the highest levels. Are witches or channelers, mediums, necromancers, whatever we want to call them, are they for real? No doubt, as Houdini discovered, and I've been a fan of Houdini and read a, over, about him over the years. Uh, of course, I used to be fascinated by magic when I was a kid. Um, Houdini uh, wanted to know about, is there life after death? But he was convinced that all these uh, mediums that were going around in his day were fakes, and he proved, as far as I know, everyone he tested 
to be a fake. Uh, con men, con women. However, there are those who traffic in demons. This is the problem. Listen now to Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortune and interprets omens or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. And notice how these two are linked. Those who offer up their children through the fire, sacrifice them in a living, burning fire, sacrifice, daughter or son, um, with the divination or the tellers of fortunes, uh, are the interpreter of omens in the country. They are linked together. In other words, listen to this then, which brings it very clear to the point. Psalm 106, 36 through 38. They serve their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. What these scriptures warn against are not con people, but against contacting the dark side, which is demonic. Take notice of the connection of idolatry with demonic violence in the above scripture. Although contacting those who traffic in the dark side is a clear way uh, of inviting demonic into your life, it's not always clear how those who are innocent get abused by the demonic. So let me go over that again because we get some scripture to take into account here. Uh, Although contacting those who traffic in the dark side is a clear way, obviously, of inviting the demonic into your life, it's not always clear how those who are innocent get abused by the demonic. For example, hear this testimony from the Syrophoenician woman of the Gospels, Mark 7, 24 through 30. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Seraphonician by birth, and she begged him to cast out the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Now, there's a lot in there that people would be interested in. Why was Jesus sort of off-puttish here? Uh, Not listening to the woman's request, but we'll have to address that some other time. What we want to look at here is the fact that she had a little daughter. And that's actually in the Greek. It's a little, not just a daughter, a little daughter. And this little daughter has an unclean spirit. Say, how's that happen? Yeah. All right. But let's take another look somewhere else. Mark 9, 14 through 18. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. So here's a father who, like the mother we just looked at, Syrophoenician woman, is uh, really tore up because he has a child. As we want to find out, it's a young child, a young boy, who's been demonized for a long time. And um, he wants relief. He wants help. Now... Hear how the demon demonized this young lad. Mark nine twenty through 22. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. How long has this been happening? From childhood. 
So, did the little daughter of the Syrophoenician woman do something evil to invite demons into her life? Did the boy who's been demonized since childhood do something wicked to be so tortured? Was the mother of the daughter or the father of the son responsible for this? How did it happen? Here's what we do learn from this. We learn from this that we can innocently invite demons in and not know it. Uh -huh. That means whether it's a child or whether it's an adult. Now, I know that's very scary, but that's what the conclusion I draw from this and have over the years every time I study it. I can testify personally from experience that playing innocently with an Ouija board for some can bring about a long-term obsession with the dark side. So often when you explain this to people, they say, well, but I, I want to play with the Ouija board, but I'm not intending for to get demon possessed. I just want to see, you know, try it out. And the answer to that is, once you open the door, you have no control over what comes out. Yeah, I, I going back to, in middle school, I was in eighth grade, mm -hmm. in my eighth grade in English class. The teacher allowed us to have a Ouija board in that class. Mm. And... Again, this goes back, you know, to the 80s. But we had a Ouija board in the class. My only experience with a Ouija board. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a history buff. And I know a lot about um, history, particularly military history. And I'm, I'm in eighth grade. And I'm around a bunch of, there was some, a bunch of girls there. And one other boy who was, uh, you know, a, a, no one could have known the answer to some of these questions. So I... You know, we ask questions, you know, how, of the Ouija board. We got the lights off. Everybody's got their hands on it, or at least five of us do. And we ask questions, you know, how did you die? War was the answer. And I was like, war. Okay, which war? And it was Vietnam. And I'm like, oh, okay. How did you die? And it was, and the answer was pilot. And it's, and I just said, okay, what did you fly? Knowing full well mm -hmm. that no one around that circle would know any of the aircraft that flew in Vietnam except for me. And it came back uh, an, an F-104. <laughs> and I immediately said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Because no one would have known, you know, yeah. the type of, like, and that was my only experience with a Ouija board. And I thought I, there was something to that. Even, mm -hmm. But it was before I was a Christian, too. Mm -hmm. I just knew I didn't like it. Yes. Uh, and people say, but but that was, that was the, that's why people seek these things, the Ouija board, because you get the truth. And the point is, you get a, a truth that is used then to deceive you yeah. and bring you in just like uh, Satan trying to tempt Jesus by saying, you know, all these were given to me. And there is truth in that. They were at his disposal because he's the God of this age. Yeah. But uh, that's a truth you don't embrace. Well, there was uh, also when, when, when uh, Saul summons Samuel, mm -hmm. it said some, someone having the appearance of Samuel. And I was wondering, was it actually Samuel or yeah. wasn't it? You know, yeah. it, was, it seemed kind of... Eerie. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one where, in my opinion, it was really Samuel because the whoever wrote First Samuel in that chapter says uh, three different times, and Samuel said, and Samuel said, and oh, Samuel okay. said. So I'm going to take it that it was Samuel who said. Yeah, I think that's the best way to go. Okay. Um, so the Ouija board uh, can bring about a long-term obsession with the dark side. The same can be said for playing with tarot cards, crystal ball gazing, etc. Now, I can testify that my sister started out with a Ouija board and ended up being severely damaged spiritually and health-wise by the occult. Uh, she did repent, and maybe someday we'll have a reason to uh, go into that in some fashion. But why should this be of concern to us? Well, Halloween isn't your grandpa's Halloween anymore. Here's a Touchstone article from the magazine Touchstone. This is the September-October edition, and a uh, article by Alan C. Carlson, points out that Newsweek magazine reports that the number of self-identified witches in the USA now exceeds 1.5 million, uh -huh. up from a mere 8,000 in 1990. I believe that. 1990, 8,000, now million and a half witches. And earlier we read the one witch, uh, uh, Ariana, <laughs> who said that uh, the Ouija board is a big factor in their witchery in contacting dead people, all right? Um, and uh, here in this article of Touchstone, it's noted that the total spent for Halloween is second only now to Christmas. Um, out of the research that I've done, this year we will spend an estimated $8 billion with, and that's with prices 13% inflation, 13% above what they were last year. 
uh, at this time. Well, I, I don't know if you can still buy the Ouija board or not, but but Milton Bradley, the gaming company, yeah, right? along with it. Connect Four and Sorry and Monopoly, and, yeah, and it's like, oh, and then here's a Ouija board too. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that somebody who just concocted something for fun lost it to the dark side. Yeah, and that happens with many things that are. The intent is this will be fun, and and somebody who's on the dark side takes it and turns it into something else. Yeah. So in my day, we went trick or treating. We wore spooky costumes, maybe. And to my knowledge, my knowledge, no one grew up demon possessed. Um, the same cannot be said for those who dabble in the paraphernalia of the occult. So today, the dark side, in certain ways, has co-opted the Halloween holiday. And that's what you got to watch out for. I mean, Ouija boards are going to be more prevalent, perhaps, than we've seen before in matters of Halloween things. John Ramirez, a former Satanist, is totally against any kind of Halloween involvement. And if you want to know about John Ramirez, you can Google him. He's on the Internet and all of his testimonies about that. You know, I have, uh, I have multinational folks. Uh, with a global team, folks from other countries. And uh, I have a, a friend from Nigeria now, and originally from Nigeria, and, a, and someone from uh, Costa Rica as well. They they can't believe the Halloween holiday. They don't practice that in their countries. Right. Right? And they just find it just strange that we celebrate that. Well, they're like, why would you celebrate something demonic? Like, yeah. like, and the unfortunate thing they've said is, like so many things, America leads the way in so many things. When they see this in America, well, now everybody wants to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, most unfortunate. Yeah. 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 Well, just as over the decades, anti-God narratives have found their ways into movies, television, you name it, into the culture at large, so also Halloween's been infected with the dark side and anti-God darkness. Our concern here is that there certainly appears to be more of an opportunity now for innocence, that is people, children, to become too curious in matters of spooks and spirits. An innocent turn at the Ouija board can lead to a lifetime involvement with the occult. And that's never good. It always ends bad. So what's a Christian parent to do? Well, first of all, know the following. At the cross, the dark side, the demonic, angelic, and all that was absolutely defeated. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, first he says at the cross, our record of debt, you know, our spiritual debt, our sins that stood against us, demanded our death. But Jesus died for our sins. But then he goes on further and says, not only that, he disarmed the rulers, the authorities, people of the dark side, the spirits of the dark side, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, in himself, and in the cross. For example, here's a few short scriptures on that. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Yes, that's uh, Jesus. Now he's still alive and well on planet earth, but he's been defeated. Mm -hmm. He's been defeated. But we still have to deal with it because that is apparently part of God's will in this present evil age. John 14, 30. I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. And he could get no claim. And Jesus conquered him. 16, John 16, 11. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Yes, he's been judged. The God of this age, as Paul calls him in 2 Corinthians 4. But therefore, we got to balance that out because faith is always a paradox balancing of two truths holding them in tension. On the one hand, the evil... The darkness, the darkness of the evil sides have been defeated. On the other hand, 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. There you go. And that's what's happening. Too much in this culture. Idolatry, demons, sorcery, all of that are linked together by scriptures. 
And we need to understand that. Galatians 5.20. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Yes, idolatry and sorcery. And sorcery is just what you think it is. You know, the dark side. The magic, supposedly, of the dark side. Revelation 9, 20 through 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual moralities or their thefts. Notice there again the connection between idolatry and demons. Idolatry is taken very serious by the Bible. At the end of uh, 1 John chapter 5, the last thing John says is, Dear children, keep yourself from idols. And by idolatry means whatever you make your ultimate concern. And people who get into the occult make that their ultimate concern. It may start, may not start out that way, but it becomes that way. So there's rampant idol worship in today's world. Where in the past people went all out for Christmas decorations, now many go out for Hall- Halloween. I remember last year, about the same time a year ago, I did a communion meditation, and that was the point I made. Some people take Halloween way too seriously. Listen to this now, as we're going to apply it to the Halloween situation, dealing with something else, but the principle is applicable. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 22. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? The food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Uh, Now, the background for this, of course, is the discussion over meat offered to uh, idols in the marketplace and how to, uh, to address that. And he's making the point in verse 20. He says, no, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. He says, there is a demonic aspect of this that you don't want to participate in. And I don't want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You know, you can't do a participation of both. Now, there's a nuance here. We got to look at it. Um, so we're going to take a look now at First First Corinthians ten twenty through twenty four, and then expand a little more. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. All things are lawful. Yes, it's a matter of law that Satan and the dark side's been defeated. Uh, but not all things are helpful. How do you go about dealing with that? Do you just Go in and sit down in a demonic setting and just think you can have a good old time. Yeah. Um, Paul's saying, no, uh, not everything builds up and is good for our neighbor. So that's uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, 24. The rest of that chapter deals with, let me just summarize it for you. He says, what if you have a friend and he invites you to dinner? He's a unbeliever. He's a pagan. And they have some meat there or whatever, roast beef at the dinner. And he says, and you're given this roast beef, he go ahead and eat it. He said, but now if someone comes up to you and has a conscience about this, I mean, really is dealing with this and says, don't you know that was taken from the marketplace where it was offered to demons? First, Paul would say, then don't eat it for conscience sake. Not your conscience because you're free. You don't have a problem with it, but this person has a real issue with that. And so you've got to make sure you, as Paul says in other places, don't destroy uh, in the matter of food someone who is a Christian because you're, you're free to do it because you understand that they have been defeated and that there's no problem with eating meat. We're not in the marketplace. We're not at the altar. It's out here. God owns everything. He owns his meat. But if someone is still maybe a new convert is having or difficulty in some way, yeah, yeah. Uh, can be harmed by that yeah. and, and messed up spiritually. So um, someone comes up to you and says, are you going to the Joneses Halloween party? And you said, well, yeah. I said, man, uh, 
I've, I've seen that. That's demonic. I saw this or I saw that. And maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but obviously they have a conscience about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're going to some Halloween party or you're going to wear a certain kind of outfit, you're going to some kind of creepy gathering and somebody who's a Christian like yourself says, mm, I did that. That's uh, You don't want to do that because there's something evil there. Uh, even though you may say, I can handle it, or it's not going to be a problem for me, for that person's conscience, you should decline to go. That's just that simple. Well, and that's part of being spiritually mature, um, answering that. Yeah. You know, we could say, well, you know, they're not, they're, they're younger in their faith, whatever. We could play that card, and, and that's not what we're to do. Right. We're, we're, we're to love our neighbor and to, you know. Build them up in the faith. Exactly. Yeah. So wisdom and caution are needed as never before. Perhaps soon there'll be a Christian consensus on this matter. Uh, for example, those of you out there in TV land who have Me TV may know that every Saturday evening, Svengoolie uh, <laughs> comes on and he has these crazy old vampire stories and Frankenstein things and about, you know, demons and devils and whatever. Uh, they were made 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago and whatnot. And, and has fun with them and etc. I'm a fan of that. Uh, and I don't think I'm demon possessed or about to be demon possessed. Um, but being too curious about the dark side so that you want to know about the paraphernalia. You want to read their books. You want yeah. to take their card. You want to try out a Ouija. Mm -mm, no, 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 no. And so often we find trick or treat, as with other cultural questionable scenarios, starts with Genesis chapter 3. You remember the temptation with Eve and the devil? Devil says, you know, if you eat this, you'll be like God. Eve thought it was a treat. Serpent knew it was a trick. Huh. She fell for the treat and found out she'd been tricked and she paid the price. When people say, well, you really believe the Genesis account? And I always say, I believe it because it explains so much from that one event in Genesis chapter 3 of why the world is the way it is today. So, uh, trick or treat, or trick or triumph. Triumph, of course, through Jesus in the cross that we read, that Randy read from Colossians chapter 2, how at the cross he defeated the powers of darkness, are called authorities, powers, principalities, and other places and oh. such. Uh, and in his resurrected ascension to the throne of God, wherein he now rules, he rules over all demons, principalities, and powers. Listen to this from 1 Peter three twenty through 22. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Yes. Uh, baptism, which corresponds to this. The this is being referred to is the flood of Noah, where in a few verses earlier, Peter says eight people were saved through the water. So he says, you've become Christian now, you know, you've been duly baptized, and you've been saved, and this is not about getting dirt off your body, this is how you appeal to God for a good conscience, but it comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a good conscience, which we just talked about, you want to have, <laughs> and Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, and angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. You say, well, it says angels, yeah, but these are bad angels, good angels are always subjected to him. Yeah. They showed up in the uh, wilderness and strengthened him, according to the gospel accounts. Uh, and also, uh, angels strengthened him in the Garden of Gethsemane and came. Uh, angels are subjected to... This means the bad angels, the bad authorities, the bad powers have been subjected to him because he's won the war. They are subjected to him. We can only be tricked if we forget that. Remembering that, we can, in wisdom deal with Halloween and throw the light of Jesus upon the dark side. Witchcraft or which, witchcraft? Witchcraft should we choose? Not witchcraft, but witch, W-H-I-C-H, craft. The craftiness of God's wisdom. That's what we should have, which is smarter than the diviners of this age. For as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world through, of course, the foolishness of the cross? He's made... Uh, foolish, the wisdom of the world. So that's where we end up with always with Jesus at the cross or now at the throne of God ruling in heaven. He's defeated the dark side and we need to remember that. And even though it's defeated, 
it's still a hazard on planet Earth, and we need to guide ourselves accordingly, and that's the Christian expectation. Well, thanks, Jim. That's a lot to unpack and to talk about, and I'm sure that you have questions or comments on it. So if you would, please send us your questions or comments, uh, either via email to events and expectations, all one word, at gmail.com, or on a post uh, for the comments in the podcast. We will always take your questions seriously, and we will always answer you. This has been Current Events and Christian Expectations, and until next time, keep looking up.